This program is a legacy program which was recorded some time ago. Views and subject matter are products of the time in which they were recorded and may not reflect current news or cultural stances. Greetings and salutations, truth seekers, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Midnight Hour, the Mystery Man Show, with me, your host, Stephen Camby. Because who better than a magician, a man trained in the art of deception and misdirection, to investigate for you some of the greatest mysteries on planet Earth. Broadcasting from a secure and secret location somewhere in the United States. Traveling to you at light speed through the miracle of this thing called the Internet. Tonight, we're going to go down one of my very favorite rabbit holes again, and that is on the subject of UFOs. Are extraterrestrial spacecraft really visiting Earth? Are alien intelligences really interacting with members of the human race? Let's find out. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited and delighted to let you know that tonight's guest is none other than UFO researcher, author, and lecturer, Stanton Friedman. Stanton Friedman has been called the godfather of ufology. He was the original civilian investigator into the Roswell incident and is largely responsible for why people even know about Roswell today. He is quite possibly the most respected ufologist or person that studies the field of UFOs in the world today. And with good reason, when Stanton talks, people listen. He is a man of science, a nuclear physicist who believes in UFOs and extraterrestrial spacecraft visiting Earth. He's one of the most respected authors and in-demand lecturers in the field today. And you know, all of his lectures and books are based on solid evidence, solid science, and great research, which is why I can't wait to talk to him. So without further ado, let's go to the mystery phone. You know, I don't even know where to start. I've read all your books and everything. I, I guess the first question I have for you is, what really got you, from your background, interested in UFOs, and what kept you so interested? Well, it's pretty straightforward, actually. I was working as a young nuclear physicist for General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department in Cincinnati way back in 1958. And it was a big program, and it was exciting work. Uh, work was classified, but there, it wasn't a black budget program. And I was ordering books from Marlboro Books, I think in New York at that time. I don't know where they are now. And I needed one more book. I had no particular interest in UFOs. I had read a lot of science fiction when I was young, but that was different. Uh, and I needed one more book so I wouldn't have to pay shipping. I'm a cheapskate. Uh, and there was the report on unidentified flying objects by Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, who had headed Project Blue Book in the early 50s. And the Air Force was a co-sponsor of our program, so I was pro-Air Force, and one thought was, gee, if these things are real and I didn't have an opinion, I don't believe you're entitled to an opinion if you don't have any facts at hand. Uh, if these things are real, uh, it would certainly help our program in <laughs> getting more support for nuclear airplanes. And uh, so I ordered the book. And you know, it wasn't costing me anything because shipping would have been a dollar uh, if I hadn't ordered that book. <laughs> So I read the book. It intrigued me. It didn't convince me, but it intrigued me. And I loaned it to my neighbor, Charlie, who was 10 years older than I was and a good engineer. And he, he was more impressed than I was. And that impressed me because I was impressed with Charlie. <laughs> And a funny thing, 10 years later, he attended a lecture I gave at an electronics, electrical elect engineers group. And he said, the first thing he said was, we knew you, his wife was with him, uh, when you didn't believe in flying saucers. That was good to hear. Anyway, I read that book. I went off to California, read 10 more books, had a good uh, librarian. 
and some of them were trash. And if I'd read them first, I'd have never read another one. Hmm, uh, sure. And then I made a shocking discovery. At the University of California Berkeley Library, I found a copy of the largest study ever done for the United States Air Force, Project Blue Book Special Report 14. The trouble was it wasn't mentioned in any of the books that I had read. And they included, whoever put Leon, Dr. Leon Davidson, who worked at Los Alamos, had put this together. Uh, it was published in 1955. This was already 1961. And he included a copy of the press release, which got very wide distribution, but the report didn't get wide distribution. And I was totally shocked to find two things. One, the enormous amount of data, charts, tables, graphs, maps. I was in data heaven. But there, in the press release, the Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Quarles, said, on the basis of this study, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions. Well, that was a total lie, and I don't like being lied to. I mean, I had the report. Here are the charts, the tables, the graphs. The unknowns, and they looked at 3,201 cases. That's a lot of cases. That's why I say the biggest study ever done. The press release, incidentally, didn't give the title of the report. Some newsmen would certainly have asked what happened to 1 through 12, well, 1 through 13. Uh, one time, the excuse was given, well, there was no 13, because, you know, like some buildings don't have 13th floor. <laughs> <laughs> which is nonsense, you know. Anyway, uh, looking at the data, not only were 21.5% unknowns, which is a long way from thirty uh, from 3%, where I come from anyway, uh, but they had a quality evaluation. The better the quality of the site, the more likely to be unexplainable. They had a separate category called insufficient information. If there wasn't enough data, available about a sighting to reach a conclusion it was listed as insufficient information which is not what the Air Force said that's a little different and, than explained too yes and they also found they did a cross comparison between the unknowns they're the only ones we're interested in and, and the knowns uh, on the basis of six different observables, so apparent color, size, shape, speed, that sort of thing, they found the probability that the unknowns were just misknowns was less than 1%. The two groups did not match. And so I got angry. I don't like being lied to. I mean, I, having a security clearance, you get used to sort of sometimes tiptoeing around the truth. But find out blatant lying like this? They also, the press release didn't mention who did the work or where the work was done. Their connection between Battelle Memorial Institute, which did do the work, and Columbus, Ohio, very well-respected research and development firm. They run a couple of the big national labs. Uh, I visited there on business uh, uh, later on. Uh, and so I got determined. I joined the two big UFO groups, APRO and NICAP, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization and National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, Major Kehoe's outfit, and to get their newsletters and stuff and started talking to guys at lunch uh, about UFOs. And, uh, you know, I must have set a record for working on canceled government-sponsored research and development programs because I moved on from there. You know, you spend the money. And instantly, uh, many people have no idea how big these programs were, how much money was spent. When I was working on GEANP, Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion, our budget in 1958 was $100 million. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. This wasn't six professors and 20 grad students. Yeah. It was a major wow. program. Yeah, and I, I, like I say, I enjoyed the work because I had access to all kinds of exotic materials, uh, lithium hydride, for example, beryllium, uh, other uh, gadolinium hydride. That was one of my favorites, <laughs> You don't see much of that on the market. Uh, anyway, uh, I moved to Indianapolis to work for General Motors uh, on the military compact reactor program and other stuff. 
and when I was there, I got to know Frank Edwards, who was a journalist, and he was on the board of NICAP. He was very interested in UFOs, and he wrote a, a book, a best-selling book, uh, Flying Saucer's Serious Business. And I got to know Frank, and I moved to uh, Pittsburgh to work for, because the GM project folded, to work for Westinghouse Astronuclear Lab. And Frank gave me a copy of his book, and I called him, and I said, Frank, you know everybody, and he did. Uh, I want to go public on this subject. Uh, so he gave me some names, and one of them was the producer for a radio talk show uh, called, would you believe, Contact. <laughs> Honest to God. In KDKA Pittsburgh, which is the biggest, uh, I don't, you probably know about KDKA, but uh, the biggest uh, media outlet in Pittsburgh at that time anyway. And uh, I called the guy who was the producer of the show, thinking that being a Westinghouse nuclear physicist in Pittsburgh, which is a Westinghouse town, uh, he'd of course want to have me on. No, he didn't. Don't call us. We'll call you. Well, less than a month later, he called me because somebody had canceled at the last minute. Could I please go on the show at 7 o'clock? This is 6.30. Uh, and I often wondered how many people did he call before he got me. Yes. <laughs> I live close to the station, so uh, I could make the show. And because of that show, and I wasn't as uh, adept at that time as dealing with the nasty, noisy negativists as I am now, but uh, uh, somebody at work at Washinghouse, uh, a woman called me and said, uh, Stan, we have a book review club and we're reading Frank's book. Could you give us a talk about flying saucers? So my first lecture was in somebody's living room in Pittsburgh. And I did the show uh, many times and I did a lot more lectures. And then, uh, you know, things happen. There must be a reason. I don't know why. But I'm riding to work one of two days in a three-year period with a supervisor at Westinghouse, a woman who had a Ph.D. from Carnegie Mellon. And uh, my car was in the garage. I needed a ride. And Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Lab was out in a small town called Large, believe it or not. And I'm talking to Joanne, and I said, gee, I'd like to speak at Carnegie Mellon. He said, you talk to the dean? Well, no, I talked to Dr. So-and-so, and, -so, and he, didn't, he wasn't interested. She said, Stan, the dean's my husband. He's heard you on the radio. Why don't you give him a call? Okay. So I called him, and we arranged for a date uh, three weeks later and in the afternoon, so I'd have to take some time off work. Hmm. His last question was, how much do you want? Mm, how about $100, thinking you'd knock me down to 50 This is in 1967. Uh, sold. He bought me for 100 but then he told me, he sent a, a nice letter to the agent who booked the other three speakers he had booked from that agent, and he, Gene told me what he was paying these guys, 1500 1700 1600 Woo! That's a lot of money back then, and, yeah. Yeah, and so, <laughs> well, yeah, and he sent a letter to the agents after I had done a good job, and we had a good crowd and lots of questions and so forth. The agent booked me, and a very important talk for me, the Engineering Society of Detroit. Now, I may buy Japanese cars, but I certainly respect the Engineering Society of Detroit. And they paid me 300 bucks plus expenses. And what was shocking to me, frankly, is it turned out they were sold out three weeks in advance for 1,008 people for dinner and a talk. And there wasn't one negative question. That impressed the heck out of me. Because uh, I had to respect these people. And these weren't little old ladies in tennis shoes, you know, the old expression. So I gave more, more talks. Some, uh, science background, and they still have a huge interest in this. Yeah, which came as a, I had no idea what to expect. And uh, so I gave, uh, I talked, gave them talk, I was still giving talks whenever I could. And I asked my boss, I need some advice, I said, guidance. Uh, I like 
talking. Uh, it turns out I'm a real Leo. I enjoy being on the stage. And at that time, I had a great memory, so I could count on my data being right. Uh, I said, I need some advice. Uh, what restrictions and so on? Because I don't want to lose my job. I want to lose my clearance. You know, I've got a mortgage and family and so forth. And the, the comeback was, look, uh, three rules we would suggest. One, you can say whatever you please, wherever you please on your time. Two, you can identify yourself as a Westinghouse nuclear physicist. And three, we'd like you to start your talk with a disclaimer that the views you're about to hear are mine and mine alone and not those of my employer. Ah, who could ask for anything more? Well, I did ask for something more because I got a call from an associate at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, in New Mexico. He was working on radiation shielding for nuclear rockets, and by this time, that's what I was working on for Westinghouse. So we, I saw him on business a couple of times. Stan, how about speaking to the local section of the American Nuclear Society? Oh, I'd be delighted. I'm a member of the Nuclear Society. And uh, he said, no, I mean on an expense account. Oh, <laughs> I don't make those <laughs> decisions. Check with management. Yeah, they paid for me to go from Pittsburgh to Los Alamos, New Mexico, to give a lecture. Flying saucers are real. Uh, I was on the payroll, and they paid the expenses, and they didn't hide it. You know, sometimes you say technical discussion is a reason for a trip. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they had over 500 people, one of the biggest crowds they ever had. And again, there were no negative questions. So I was enthusiastic, and I thought that my best technical moment in my professional life was well, shortly thereafter when we tested our nuclear rocket reactor propulsion system out at the uh, nuclear test site in Nevada, and it was a great success. Uh, I'll give you something to judge by, the power level of our system was 1,100 megawatts. Uh, Los Alamos' system, a little later, uh, was 4,400 megawatts, twice the power of Hoover Dam. Wow. Uh, and it was less than eight feet in diameter, and the exhaust temperature of the liquid hydrogen, when in cold, came out very hot, was over 4,000 degrees. Very impressive. And then, of course, the program got canceled. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was, still, this was back when we still had a space program. I mean, now all we do is low Earth or Earth orbit. We, we don't have any well, information. Yes, we do. We use the Russians to take us up to the space station. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you, uh, you know? Not to get sidetracked, but how do you feel about w what what happened with all of that? Because I've read all this research about nuclear propulsion, and they they could have went to anywhere with that, and instead, we well, to Mars, Earth orbit, you know. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I was at a meeting uh, when I was at the third part of the three groups uh, was Aerojet General in Sacramento. They built uh, a more flight-ready system than we had. It was only 1,000 megawatts. And I was out there uh, for technical discussions, and uh, my counterpart asked, hey, you want to attend a meeting? The Space Nuclear Propulsion Office is having a meeting. Sure, and the purpose of the meeting was to discuss what we should do with the nuclear rocket. Worst meeting I ever attended in my life. They had no idea what they wanted to do with the nuclear rocket. Well, we could go Earth orbit, lunar orbit. We could set up a base on the moon. Uh, maybe we should go to Mars. No, nobody would pay for that. And look, if you don't have a goal, you don't get the dough to go where you want to go. My model is the uh, nuclear navy, Admiral Rickover. People hated his guts, but he developed nuclear submarines. You know, we heard an awful lot, at least I did growing up, about the danger of the German U-boats during the war, sinking ships all over the place. They could stay underwater for about a day. They needed oxygen, air for the uh, diesel engines, so you had to come up to get the air. Uh, the nuclear submarine could go around the world underwater without coming up for anything. And then they built nuclear aircraft carriers, which, believe it or not, could operate for 18 years without refueling. Yeah, I've read about that. That's amazing to me. Like, I it is. I believe that it's something that, because I've been on one, 
and and it's so huge huge yes <laughs> and, and to think like this thing doesn't even have to refuel like i'm not a nuclear physicist i guess they they have to refuel the reactor every 18 years no new uranium yeah or something like that yeah, because they use what's called burnable poison. There are materials that absorb neutrons. So if they decrease at the same rate as the uranium decreases because it's getting used up slowly, then the balance stays okay. you got to be clever on how you do this. But it, there's an analogy here which may not strike people. We'll go from there to the space program. People tell me about how could a saucer come here from a, another solar system and crash in the desert. Come on, Stan, that wouldn't happen. I don't think what crashed in the desert at Roswell or Aztec or anyplace else it came directly. I think it was an Earth excursion module on board a huge mothership. Yeah, we have not craft, right? I've heard you say that. Uh, yeah. I completely agree with you. Yeah, just as the aircraft carrier has about 75 little airplanes that can operate for, what, two hours without refueling <laughs> a good day, you know. Uh, so uh, we, too, look, take notice of the fact that we're dealing with two different environments. Between the stars is one environment, a lot of nothing, <laughs> no atmosphere to worry about heating and gravity and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and when you get to a planet, then you got to worry about uh, lift, drag, heating, uh, sonic boom production, all kinds of other things. And incidentally, the way around that is to create uh, an ionized air region, ionize the air around you, and then you can interact with electric and magnetic fields and get around all the problems of high-speed flight. And I mention that because right after our great success at Westinghouse, we canceled the program. And I'm looking around for a job, and I got a job offer from McDonnell Douglas Astronautics in California. And my job, it's unimaginable today, but it was to, was going to be to decide how to determine how flying saucers worked. Wow! Who could ask for anything more? Well, as I'm driving across the country, I hear on the radio that the program got canceled that was sponsoring this, the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program. I walk in, would you believe, with my offer letter, and she says, you know, we just laid off 5,000 people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they kept me for, for three months. But one of the things I did in those three months uh, was do a literature search on government reports using one key word, magnetoaerodynamics. And much to my surprise, I got 900 references, but 90% were classified. Somebody was spending a lot of money looking at this plasma around the craft and the atmosphere. I mean, nose cones have this problem, you understand, so you can understand some of that. And we don't know what else they might have developed, but it, it's... There are several things that the uh, nasty, noisy negativists use as their primary arguments, anti-UFO. There's no evidence. I to ask you, because you're so, you're so uniquely qualified, having worked on nuclear rockets and all this sort of thing. I've heard you talk about this before, and, and I get the same argument. How do they get there from here? So can, well, okay. can you explain then, to our listeners, how fast sure. could you go with a nuclear-powered rocket or some kind of exotic well, propulsion like that? And how long yeah. would it take you to get to, let's say, the nearest star from here? Well, let, let's look first at where you might want to go. Now, I've read recent papers that, well, since the nearest civilization is probably a thousand light years away, and, and take it from there. Well, with the wonderful... Uh, Kepler space satellite, which is looking for planets. Uh, we now have a basis for saying that on the average, every star has one or more planets. Some say one, some say 1.6. Okay, let, let's put that in the local neighborhood here. In the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, there was a star map, and the base star was 39 light years away from us. That's just down the street. But within 100 light years, there are approximately 10,000 stars. That means uh, approximately 10,000 or more planets within 100 light years. 
Okay, so we're not setting our goal on going to the next galaxy. I've seen people try to do that. The next galaxy is two million light years away. Friedman, you're crazy. Why do you need to go to the next galaxy? <laughs> you know, uh, if I want a loaf of, my wife wants a loaf of bread for dinner. I don't say I'm going to Australia. There's a wonderful bakery in Sydney there. You know, <laughs> The superstar is two miles away. <laughs> you know, How long does it take to get to the bakery? Well, it depends which one you're going to. Uh, okay, now people want half an Einstein. Einstein said, yes, the speed of light is the, the limit. But we get awful close. And that large hadron collider, you know, over at CERN in Switzerland, uh, the particles are going around at 99.9999% of the speed of light. Now, the other half of what Einstein said, he said a lot else too, but is that as you get closer to the speed of light, time slows down for the things moving that fast. Don't ask me why. That's the way God created the universe. <laughs> this is as good an answer as I know. Anyway, how much does it slow down depends on how fast you go. It only takes one year, and I, I've tried this little experiment on many campuses. I've given over 700 lectures in all 50 states, 10 provinces, and 18 other countries. So I get a chance to talk to classes, colloquia, fancy stuff. Uh, how long does it take at 1G, which we all can withstand because that's the force of gravity right here where I'm sitting and where you're sitting, um, it only takes a little less than a year to get very close to the speed of light. And I've had people guess a thousand years, a hundred years, ten years. Rarely that's, do they guess. That's what I've always had trouble getting my mind around. Like, how how long would it take you? There's no drag in space. So if you had this... That's right. I've read about these nuclear propulsion things that they were talking about in the 60s that's basically just huge nuclear explosions behind the crane. Oh, well, that's forward. different. That was a small program compared to the ones we operated, nuclear reactors. The uh, Remember, most of the energy, when you throw out a bomb out the back end and set it off, only a small amount of that energy hits the, the pusher plate at the back of the rocket. And they never tested anything because there was an agreement on no nuclear bomb testing. But the, the system that I want, if you're going to pick a real system, is nuclear fusion. Now, that's what goes on in H-bombs. But uh, to give you some comparison here, uh, I worked on a study of fusion propulsion for deep space travel in 1962. And if you want to go, you can if you got the dough. Uh, it's feasible. Now, to give you some idea of the difference it makes if you use fusion, a chemical bomb during World War II, we had 10-ton blockbusters. They released the energy of 10 tons of dynamite. Wow. And it took a big B-29 to carry that bomb. Now, that was in 1944. In 1945, we tested our first fission device, atomic bomb, if you will. And that released the energy of about 16,000 tons of TNT. Well, we kept at it. That was 45. and 52, we tested our first H-bomb fusion device. Released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. That's quite an upgrade. <laughs> and, well, the Russians went a little bit better than that. They, their biggest one released the energy of over 57 ton, million tons of TNT. One stinking bomb. <laughs> I mean that correctly, you know. So what I'm saying is nuclear fusion, uh, if you want to spend the dough to develop it. And remember, I said the, the budget on the aircraft nuclear propulsion system, we never built a nuclear-powered airplane, was $100 million in one year, 1958. Uh, the stealth aircraft was developed at a cost of $10 billion over 10 years. Uh, and so we're not talking about peanuts here if you want to develop any of these things. Uh, so fusion would do the job. And I should say, almost essentially all the energy in the universe is produced by nuclear fusion because that's what goes on in all the stars. It's not a mass of burning gas. Uh, you know, and we got to figure out how to use that. It's nuclear fusion. We didn't figure it out until 1938. Uh, fish in the same year as it happens. But, uh, you know, we didn't even discover the neutron until 1932. We're babes in the woods. We haven't been around that long. Uh, and so, 
Uh, let me go back to something I said about I, Einstein said as you get close to the speed of light time slows down how much well it depends on how close you get as an example at 99.99% of the speed of light you can go 39 light years in 6 months pilot time pilot time Another, you go out, come back, marry your granddaughter's best friend. What the hell? Uh, yeah, that's the mind-bending part of this, is that, you know, time will be yeah. constant on Earth, but for you, it will slow down. And you could go to another star and back in 300 years or something, I've heard, will pass. Well, Earth. you can go much, that depends on how fast you go. And the nice thing is, uh, incidentally, fusion uses isotopes of hydrogen and helium. Now, these are the two largest lightest and most abundant elements in the universe. So wherever you go, there's going to be hydrogen. It's Uranium is not so abundant. You're not going to find it everywhere. Yeah. And that's another reason for coming to planet Earth. Uh, it, this surprises people. Uh, it turns out that the Earth is the densest planet in the solar system. We've got eight or nine, depending on who's doing the counting, <laughs> planets. Uh, the Earth is the densest. A cubic foot of Earth weighs more than a cubic foot of any of the other planets. And you say, so what? So we have well, that means metals, right? Now you got it. And heavy metals are rare in the universe. We know uh, what goes on in the stars because we can measure the spectrum. We take the light and break it up and, oh, look what's there. Isn't it amazing? That's how we found helium. <laughs> it was in the sun. We didn't know it down here. <laughs> crazy world a anyway the, the point is that you can zip around if you've got the system to do it with it, if you want to spend the money and all the rest of that and how long it takes just how close do you get to the speed of light and people the first objection you'll hear hey Stan it takes enormous amount of the mass increases as you get close to the speed of light you forgot to mention that well I was aware of it the kicker is that, yes, if you were accelerating stuff from zero, it would take more and more energy. But if you use fusion, the particles are produced, the exhaust particles, the ones that go zipping out the back end, are produced with huge amounts of energy. We, we again, go back to the analogy between dynamite and, a, and an H-bomb, <laughs> 10 million uh, tons of chemical dynamite, TNT, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so you produce particles, charged particles. That's what, you got to be clever. You don't want to produce many neutrons because they go off in all directions and it's hard to direct them out the back end because they're not charged. How do you interact with them? But charged particles, you can kick out that way. All of them going that way, the same way. And so there are papers that have been published. This is in the scientific literature. Now, admittedly, most of the ancient academics don't know about them, especially the astronomers. Uh, for some reason, they're bound and determined. They're not going to look at any UFO information, and they're not going to look at technology done not in academia, but in uh, national laboratories or industry. They think everything's published in peer-reviewed scientific yeah, journals. I that was funny. Like, if it's not published, they don't they don't believe it exists. Well, in an un unclassified document, you understand. <laughs> if it's published in a classified document, they don't even know about it. Sure. So, it, it, it's... Well, what I find is uh, that the evidence is clear. A, that aliens are visiting. And incidentally, when I check uh, in a typical lecture, I might talk about five large-scale scientific studies. And I would ask at the end of each, I'd describe what's in it and slides and stuff. Uh, PowerPoint, sorry. Uh, i got to be up to date. Uh, and then I ask how many people have read this. And I'm lucky if 2% have read any of those five large-scale scientific studies. There, there are four rules for UFO debunkers. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. If you can't attack the data, attack the people. It's easier, and nobody will know the difference. And do your research by proclamation. Investigation is too much trouble. That's my favorite one. I've heard you say this so many times, and that's that's always been my favorite one. People that haven't... I've heard some debates that you've done, and people that haven't even done any research is just saying, well, it can't be real. Well, you know... 
you know, meaning they don't know about it. <laughs> and just to be clear on this point of how to get there, so you're saying that with conventional science that we've had since the 1960s almost, if the money was there, we could get to another star in a year and a yes. half pilot time. A year to get to the speed of light in six months pilot time between yeah, you said if you pick the right people, place. 39 light years, wow. In a yeah. year and a half of pilot time, but then on Earth, a whole lot of more years would have passed, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. And that's why I mentioned you, you go out, come back, marry your granddaughter's best friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess if they did a project like that, they'd have to get people that don't have family or are just okay with leaving, and, and everybody will be dead when you get back. Well, you bring your family along. You know, there's all kinds of ways around that. Uh, so this is the thing that's always struck me with some of the talks you've given is that some of these people that are so negative say there's no way to get there, you know, from, from there's no way for aliens to get here from there, but we have the capability to do it, and we're pretty primitive. I like how you've talked about their stars that are uh, maybe a few billion years older than ours, so there could be civilizations That's right. that are a few billion years ahead of us in science. And you, yeah, well, a thousand would probably do it. <laughs> one of the things I love about what you're talking about here with just the regular technology is you're not talking about some crazy exotic stuff that we don't even have that's just a theory like fourth dimension time warping you mean <laughs> yeah wormholes. I, mean, I don't know about, about that wormholes and warp drives and this is all theoretical you're talking about actual science that we've already got we just need the money yeah. to do it yeah, and I don't think we should spend the money, frankly, because I think if we're going to another star, it ought to be an Earthling project. And a planet that is spending a trillion dollars on things military this year, not a very friendly place, is it? Yeah, I, I always think about that when people say, why should we go to Mars? We've got enough problems down here. You know, we're just going to blow trillions of dollars on wars that are meaningless. You know, I, think going, I can't believe we haven't been there yet. It's well within our capability. Look, no destination. I, we just go to low Earth orbit, orbit and, you know, do some experiments there, which is meaningful. Well, it, it's kind of, it's the lack of leadership that gets to me. Uh, I, when I was in the space program in the 60s, I certainly expected we'd have a base on the moon by the end of the century. And uh, the, by this time, we certainly would have gone to Mars. And they are taking, people are volunteering to go on one-way trips to Mars, as, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I've read uh, all about that. That's a, it's amazing to me. I don't think they'll ever make it work, but it's it's interesting. Well, who, who knows? And remember, if you put a fish in upper stage there, you triple, double or triple the payload that you can send. So that's kind of neat. Uh, now, and there's, there's another uh, objection Governments can't keep secrets. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an outstanding astronomer, Hayden Planetarium in New York, uh, he finished off or uh, redid the Cosmos series. Uh, when he gave a talk at Penn State University, uh, he said the proof that the government can't keep secrets is how much we know about President Clinton's genitalia which is a very funny remark, but totally unrelated to the question of whether the government can keep secrets. And yeah, I, always, I think you do, too. I always mention the Manhattan Project when people say the government can't keep secrets. They had thousands and thousands of people working on that. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the facility for enriching uranium was a gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It was a mile long and... We used, it used 5% of all the electricity produced in the United States to pump the uranium hexafluoride gas through little holes on barriers and when it goes in one end and comes out the other, it's slightly enriched because U-235 is a little lighter than U-238. And you keep doing this and, you know, electricity was at a premium during the war. We had to build uh, planes and tanks and ships and stuff like that. And yet 5% of the country's electricity was used in secret. Uh, that's the reason it was in Oak Ridge, incidentally. Uh, they had Tennessee Valley uh, dams producing electricity and nothing much to do with it except in Virginia. <laughs> 
but uh, there, I, I show often, I have shown on television and in my lectures, some of the top secret Umbra NSA UFO documents. Everybody knows about the NSA, thanks to Mr. Snowden. Uh, never says anything. That's what that stands for. Uh, anyway, there was a long legal action starting in the 80s, uh, Freedom of Information Act the suit by the citizens against UFO secrecy, against the CIA, and then eventually the NSA. And it turns out the NSA eventually released, they held on to say we can't release anything because sources and methods information, and that's against the law to release. They finally released 156 pages of top secret Umbra NSA UFO documents. Wow, there was a little problem. Uh, you could read one sentence per page. Everything else was not blacked out. White it out. White it out. Yeah, I've I've heard I've seen you hold up the, these blacked out papers or whited out papers when people say there's no cover up. You know, you could read one word at a page or something. One so, sentence per page, yeah, not much so better. Kind of, and, even when they release it, I think this Freedom of Information Act now is just castrated. It's worthless. It it should be called the Freedom to Know What We Want You to Know. Act. Well, because that's certainly the case. They don't. They don't release it. I I filed a bunch of FOIA requests for Kexberg. Uh, the Kexberg yes. Case. I filed. I can't tell you how many. Uh, all different wordings. You know, you got a hundred yeah. witnesses in that town that saw all these military people. Uh, they came back. And we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. <laughs> so. Well, they even went to court. Uh, and John Podesta was involved in that, uh, in the legal action to try to recover that data. A woman named Leslie Kane, uh, Keen has written an excellent book about generals and pilots and so forth tell us their UFO stories. And they tried to get the Air Force to release data, and uh, they couldn't find any. And incidentally, on these 156 pages of NSA UFO, documents. John Greenwald, who has an extremely good uh, site on the internet and called the Black Vault, thousands of pages. That. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. I, I'm, I'm on there a lot, <laughs> looking up stuff. And... Well, he has now reported that uh, they can't even find now the original documents, the whited out ones, you know? They're gone. Somehow they disappeared. Sorry, folks. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, and, and incidentally, the CIA in that same legal action had released up to it was a little under 900 pages of documents. And not all blacked out. I mean, uh, there was plenty of redaction, as it's called. But I finally went after them years later and got some top secret Umbra one. Dozens of pages. And it's all blacked out. <laughs> well, yeah. six words here, you know, <laughs> ten words on that page, stuff like that. So it's it's almost a joke. But anybody who says the government can't keep secrets doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, they goof once in a while, you know. And I certainly had my arguments with people classifying stuff when I was working in the industry that, hey, any college student majoring in physics would know that. Why is that classified? <laughs> You know, these elements aren't on a list of things we're looking at because that would give away secrets. Well, the fact that they're not there would give away a secret, you know. Well, while so we're, While we're talking about documents, I wanted to ask you about your work on the Majestic 12 documents. Oh, yes, dear old Majestic 12. This is, this is one of my favorite, I mean, just to take all those and read them from, you know, well, the, one day is amazing. You have to recognize that uh, most of these so-called MJ-12 documents are phonies, or hoaxes, or... Uh, I, I found that out the easy way. Uh, I was... Th there was one document that mentioned General Wiedemeyer, and as far as I knew, he was a China expert. Why would he be involved in something about UFOs? So I called the Marshall Archives, George C. Marshall, uh, Chief of Staff during World War II, who went on to become Secretary of State, and so forth. Anyway, and I asked the archivist, I said, can you think of any reason why Wiedemeyer would have been a part of this the UFO stuff? He said, no, why don't you look at his book? I didn't know he'd written a book. Uh, Wiedemeyer reports, this is back in the 50s. Okay, I called the University of New Brunswick Library, which is two miles from my house, 
and asked about it. They had a copy. So I went over and got it and brought it back and started looking. I found three documents in there that were among these MJ-12 documents. They, except that they had been, uh, how should I put this, adjusted. Certain cha- They were retyped. The handwritten information, the signature date, uh, was left the same, and they uh, made a few changes. And they were phony documents, because I had the originals, and it was clear. And I found three in that. I went back and found another book in the same part of the library, found a few more. And so I think there are four genuine MJ-12 documents. But I have attacked, if you will, all the attackers. The reasons given for this document must be a phony. It doesn't follow the date format in the government style manual. Big deal. I've been to 20 archives, a lot of time at the Truman and Eisenhower libraries, for example. And I had one file folder that had seven different date formats. This is typewriter time, you understand. So it depended on who typed it. Uh, This was not computerized stuff. And uh, there's a whole long list of phony objections. One, uh, it said, and there's a briefing document. The key thing is a briefing document uh, for President-elect Eisenhower. And it says the briefing officer was Admiral Roscoe Hillencoder. Now, he had been head of the CIA. And the people say, well, obviously the document's a phony. He was only a rear admiral. Well, if they'd look carefully, all of the military officers were noted by their their generic rank. General that covers lieutenant general, brigadier general, major general, four-star general, uh, admiral, rear admiral, uh, and what's the other one? There's another admiral in there. And so that objection sounded great until you looked at it. And I found loads of documents from uh, Brigadier General uh, Goodpaster, who was Ike's staff secretary. When there would be meetings at the White House, he would keep track of who was there. He'd write minutes of the meeting and uh, a list of who, who was at the meeting. He always used generic ranks, even for himself. General so Goodpaster. What you're saying he, is they didn't say Rear Admiral or Brigadier General. They just said no. Admiral or General. Yeah, and you could answer the phone, General Good Pastor, but you better sign anything you wrote, Brigadier General. And there are a whole bunch of these objections, and I've got a whole book, Top Secret Magic. Uh, people can find my books with autographs if they get them from me, as, as opposed to Amazon, <laughs> at my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. It's got other information, too, but it lists all the books, the DVDs, and all this kind of stuff. Yes, and, I, would, I would highly recommend to my listeners, if you're interested in anything UFO, don't don't go anywhere else but Mr. Friedman's site because he has the most intensely researched and best books. If you're looking for factual based information on this topic, you have to get his books. Don't go buy some tabloid books that, you know, uh, are garbage, you know, because Mr. Friedman... There are plenty of them out there! <laughs> you got over 50 years investigating this stuff, and a lot of people, yeah. uh, my listeners might not be aware, but if you heard of Roswell, it's largely because of Mr. Friedman. I'm the original civilian investigator, yes. Absolutely, and I think that whole story would have just been swept under the rug, and somewhere in the secret government, there are people cursing at you. Well, probably more more than one place. (laughs) Yeah, because you really, I mean... uh, that uh, Roswell's always been my favorite UFO story because it's so many twists and turns and you know I was going to ask you, do you did you hear this new theory that these alien bodies were some kind of Japanese captured soldiers that were experimented on that people uh, oh yeah that's been around for years and uh, look one of the fanciest one is that Stalin worked with Dr. Death Joseph Mengele and they had some uh, physically uh, distressed people put on board a craft and they it, it crashed and they were trying to start a panic like War of the Worlds had started a panic 
And I hate to say that's a ridiculous argument. Uh, it, for example, the War of the World's Panic, that took place in New Jersey, right across the river from you. And uh, well, New Jersey is the most densely populated state, more people per square mile than any other state. And where the saucer crashed in New Mexico, ain't no people, damn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, that, that theory is just crazy. I, I hear somebody talk about it was Asian people from Japan. With oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the misconceptions about Roswell, though, I wanted to ask you about is that people think it was a UFO crash, but don't you believe it was two separate crash sites? Well, okay, there was a crash uh, 75 miles roughly north of Roswell, out in the middle of nowhere, near the little town called Corona. Uh, you know, like the cigar, like the Toyota Corona. And when, when there was a 50th anniversary celebration of Roswell in 97, they had a sign on the old theater in Corona. Forget about Roswell, it all happened here. <laughs> yeah, so the debris field was near Roswell, but that was, but there was an almost intact craft. Where the no, no, or no. Something in Corona? Well, the debris field was near Corona, and there may have been a crew compartment found miles away. Okay. Uh, I think the reason that I say that is because in my first conversation with Jesse Marcel, he was the major with whom I first talked, and he was the intel had been the intelligence officer at Roswell. People forget to mention, Roswell was the home of the 509th, the only atomic bombers in the entire world the most elite military group in the world. And I say that because they dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They dropped two more Operation Crossroads in the Pacific the next year. Uh, everybody had a high-level security clearance. Uh, it's great. They got a 13,000-foot runway. <laughs> and the air... Well, it's the airport now. Then it was the air base, uh, which is much longer than most places to carry big b 36s with their A bombs needed a huge runway. B uh, 36 was, I, I used to watch them fly when I was in industry and in, down in Texas. And uh, big old monster, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, Roswell, <clears throat> there was another crash over in the plains of San Augustine. And when I first talked to Jesse Marcel, and I got to him strictly out of the blue again, I was doing a television interview in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, before speaking that night at Louisiana State University. I was supposed to do three interviews, and uh, people from the university brought me to the TV station, and I did the first two, and the third reporter was nowhere to be found. So the station manager's giving me coffee. He's looking at his watch. He didn't want to lose the interview because he had it scheduled in his programming, but uh, he, he knew uh, I, I had other things to do. And out of the blue, he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Who's he? Brilliant investigator that I am, you know. And his next sentence changed my life. He handled wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? What do you know about him? Well, he lives in Homa. That didn't tell me anything because they didn't know where Homa was. <laughs> I've been there since to talk to Jesse, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he's a great guy. We're old ham radio buddies. You ought to talk to him. So the next day, we had a great response at the university that night. The next morning, I'm at the airport early. Got a plane to catch. I thought I'd call information in Homo, wherever it was. And they had a number for a Jesse A. Marcel. Okay, I called him. And this is before the Internet, you know. Times were different then. Uh, 1978. Uh, you know, no internet. And uh, he told me a story. And people said, well, why would he talk to you? I thought it was all highly classified. His picture was in the newspapers. I found that out later. I didn't know it then. Uh, his picture was taken in the office of General Ramey, who was head of the 8th Air Force, of which the 509th was a part. And he told me a story. And his, one of the first things he said was, there was so much wreckage out there, spread out over such a large area, that he figured there had to be a mid explosion. 
because uh, there was too much stuff and it was spread out over too large an area. There was nothing conventional out there. He'd seen airplane crashes in the Pacific and there's a mess. I always, that's what I always thought when people talk about, well, it was just a weather balloon. Like, it, you know, <laughs> it was made about the 509. Is like these guys were around nuclear weapons and, and uh, I think they would know the difference between a weather balloon and an alien spacecraft or, you know. Well, Jesse had taken, he had taken a course uh, on radar and weather balloons and all this. He had to brief the airplanes when they went out on uh, planned missions, you know, send uh, a bunch of airplanes up to New York, a pseudo attack on New York, if you will. So he was very familiar, and they, weather balloons were launched every single day at the base. Uh, because you want to know which way the wind's blowing, you know, and how strong it is at altitude. You can't tell a lot from the ground. you got to send up a balloon, and it radios back information. So Jesse was very familiar with the weather balloon. Well, remember, there were four explanations. The first in the newspapers on July 8, 1947, Army captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. That was in newspapers, evening papers, from Chicago West. The press release went out too late to make the East Coast papers. And the next day, Ramey empties Roswell's saucer. saucer. Uh, so uh, the weather balloon explanation, first it said flying saucer. Then it was weather balloon radar reflector combination. And then we had the mogul balloons. Now these were 20 to 25 standard normal neoprene weather balloons at 20 foot intervals cord twine tying them together. They were supposed to be a constant altitude instrument platform. They were trying to see if they could hear a Soviet nuclear explosion because they didn't know when the Soviets would go nuclear. And uh, it, it wasn't a very good idea. So they would stay aloft for thousands of miles. And they had found that underwater, you can hear sounds over a very long distance. There's a layer of the water through which sound travels better, if you will. But the fourth explanation, the mogul balloon explanation sounds good. We were testing mogul balloons in New Mexico. Uh, the only trouble was people have looked very carefully at the logs of those who were launching the balloons. They said high security. The purpose was classified, not the technology. They were not accompanied by chase planes or anything like that to recover this exotic technology. It wasn't exotic. Uh, the fourth explanation was my favorite, though. They wrote a, the Air Force wrote a big report, the Roswell Report, Truth versus Fiction in the New Mexico desert. The Air Force applied the fiction. <laughs> the, well, the, the, the fourth explanation. They said they weren't going to say any more, but they wrote another report. Now they had discovered that we were launching crash test dummies all over New Mexico. So stories about bodies, crash test dummies, and they use the same map of where they dropped all these dummies. <clears throat> I should explain the reason for that was airplanes were flying much higher than they'd ever flown before. And if you were on board an airplane at 40,000 feet and you had to eject, uh, you wanted to make the ejection safe in the first place because you had to find out how long does it take before you come down where the temperature is reasonable. You can freeze to death. You know, at 40,000 feet, it's very, very cold up there. And you certainly aren't going to use pilots on these uh, ejection seat tests. So. And the, the bodies were dummies. I found... The Air Force officer, uh, Colonel Madsen, he's dead now, uh, who had been in charge of the program, his picture is in the Air Force report. They didn't talk to him. They went back and looked at the old records. He <clears throat> made sure that I understood a couple of things. One, the dummies were six feet tall and 175 pounds. And they were in Air Force flight gear. You say, why would you do that? Because that affects the drag and the heating of the body as it comes down. You want to measure that. Uh, and you can't do it you know, with, without a dummy that isn't properly dressed, if you will. Now, these were wooden dummies, and often when they hit the ground, the limbs came off. 
and they didn't look anything at all like a small, big-headed alien. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that was funny. Like, okay, you used... It was funny. You used, <laughs> did you use four-foot-tall aliens with big heads and big eyes and, you know, <laughs> yeah. six fingers? I, I, don't, I don't understand. Well, that. well depending weird. on who you talk to. <clears throat> and wasn't but, there a time... Wasn't there a time discrepancy, too? Like, these dummy tests... Well, none of the... Oh, yeah, the, a minor detail. Something? Yeah, none of these were launched until 53 years later. So, what's six years between friends? I mean, come on. You know, slight time lag. <laughs> time warp. <laughs> time travel for crash test dummies, the new technology. <laughs> it, You know, what, what's crazy is that explanation appeared on the front page of the New York Times. And all I can say is that at the beginning of World War II, within two weeks of Pearl Harbor, there was a director of censorship established. And, for example, the newspapers couldn't use the word uranium anyplace. They couldn't use Fugo balloon. The Japanese were launching these big balloons with explosives on board from out in the Pacific, and the winds blow them, and they're going to start fires all over the United States. And there were a few started, not many. But you couldn't talk about that. We didn't want them to know how successful or unsuccessful those balloon launches were. Uh, one person did die. There was yeah, a, I've, somebody. Read about, I've read about that. It's amazing that the government's response was to just not talk about it. They didn't want the Japanese to know that they were at all successful. So they would just yeah, think, let, well, this didn't let them waste their energy. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, what I'm saying is it looks as if... Uh, the Air Force had a, a policy of not releasing information. That's no surprise. Uh, and that, that's why I mentioned that Air Force press release about Blue Book Special Report 14. It set the tone when you have your top official in the Air Force flat out lying. And then when I tried to get more from uh, Colonel Weaver, who wrote that big fat report, he attacked the MJ-12 documents. Uh, you mentioned those. Uh, he wrote bogus on them. And when he was asked by the FBI, the uh, FBI was worried of this classified information being leaked here. What's going on? And he wrote bogus on the, every page of the documents. And the Air Force, uh, the FBI bought it. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for all the information, notes, memos, and blah, blah, blah. You know, you got to write in, in computeries. Uh, uh, and I wanted any information to back up this conclusion that uh, this, this was phony. In other words, that uh, these documents were phony. We have nothing in response to your request. Very useful. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's crazy. You can get away with it uh, if you work at it. Secrets can be kept. And look, I'm not saying the government should never lie, which may sound a little strange. But when we tested our first Avon at Trinity site in New Mexico in 1945, Didn't it was, that was uh, an earthquake or something. No, it was. Uh, <laughs> The uh, explained it away as an ammunition dump had blown oh, up. That's people, right. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. People had seen it from 100 miles away. The skies are clear in New Mexico, and that was one hell of a big firecracker. I'll tell you. <laughs> and they got away with it. And I don't blame them for doing that. Uh, certainly, uh, the government was very worried about if the Japanese found out what was going on and what cities were going to be bombed, if any, uh, they would move American prisoners of war to those cities. Yeah, I, I agree with you that in some cases, it, sure, it's it's okay to keep secrets. But if, if if Roswell really happened the way so many witnesses recall it, it's the most significant event in human history. It confirms that we are not alone in the universe. Yes. And I don't believe that anybody has the right to keep that from us. That's what keeps me interested in this and keep digging. I keep digging and digging and digging. And unfortunately, you've got to dig through so much garbage to get to any real... <laughs> you noticed that, huh? <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. sent you... Uh, I just sent you some files. You know, everyone oh. knows this audio, this... Uh, Alien autopsy was proven uh, a fraud. And yes, it was. I have just done an amazing amount of work on the alien interview. 
uh, which is a separate DVD, came out after that nobody's ever debunked, and I think I've successfully debunked it because we have proven that the person asking the apparent whistleblower the questions is also the person answering the questions. Oh, you know that, huh? Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've we've done our work. I I ran a commercial recording studio for some time, so I know uh, how to take a uh, you know how to take that vocal disguise off, and it's it's yeah. really laughable listening to this person ask the questions and answer the questions. I know his uh, name. Yes, yes, so do I, and we'll reveal it soon i have uh you know and everything that i've looked into it's like uh, it's such a waste of time to go through all these things that are frauds how do you feel about how that affects the field like this alien autopsy and all these frauds the carrot documents the fake mj12 documents? Oh yeah they they have an unfortunate impact but fortunately there are people like you and me who can go look for the truth and can reveal the truth and uh, that's why I write books uh, there is a need I don't know a better way to put it out uh, and I've got a new book coming out as a matter of fact with Kathleen Marden Betty Hill's niece we did capture the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience and we've got a new book coming out that'll be out in late this summer uh, and keep your eyes open for it because we show that some of the people who were telling the public lies were indeed lying and uh, we can demonstrate that now I'm not I'm a dumb old physicist I'm not a psychiatrist so I can't tell you why people do things you know uh, whether some of them were un well I know that in some cases they were under uh, security uh, my biggest finding about MJ-12 was that one of the people on the list Dr. Donald Menzel was a total debunker. He wrote three books. He was a Harvard University professor of astronomy. You certainly don't need a security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard or anyplace else. And all the other guys on this list of MJ-12 members uh, had high-level security clearances, Air Force generals, admirals, uh, scientists uh, who were doing classified work. But Menzel? <clears throat> to make a long story short, I had to get permission from three different people to see his papers at Harvard and was totally shocked to find that he, he knew JFK quite well because JFK was on the board of overseers at Harvard and his area of interest was astronomy. They sat breakfast together. Uh, anyway, there's a letter from Menzel to JFK saying that is just after he was elected. Uh, there's one area where I may be able to be of some assistance to you, and that's with regard to the NSA. I've had a longer, continuous association with them and their Navy predecessor than anybody. And when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. And then it turns out, by digging more, that Menzel was a world-class cryptologist. Uh, and that's what the NSA does, you know, break codes and things like that. And so it was a total shock to me because I didn't like the man. I had had one run-in with him when I was speaking at Harvard, and uh, I, I did not respect him. But once I found out what he'd been up to all this time, yeah, I've, I've, and it was a huge story. It's amazing. This guy had such a double life. Like he's a mild man, yeah. astronomy teacher, and in in the meantime, he's doing all this top secret stuff. Yeah, and you know, people say, "Oh, you can't leave a, a double life." Well, I will mention three names. Burgess, Philby, and McLean. These were three guys who worked for British intelligence, except they were Russian spies. Now, that's really leading a double life, because you have to be extraordinarily careful that you don't give away the source of the information, you know? <laughs> So, double lives are possible, and I developed a healthy respect for Menzel. I, uh, I'd even talked to his wife, uh, who didn't know anything about his classified activities, of course. That's another thing. I get people telling me, well, Stan, those guys at MJ Joe certainly would have told their wives what they do. Absolutely not. Uh, as a matter of fact, as an example of that, the man who was head of the Manhattan Project was General Leslie Groves. And he worked at the Pentagon. And 
his wife received a call from somebody in the, the general's office telling her on August the 6th, 1945, that he thought she should listen to the radio news at noon. Okay, so she listens. He didn't tell her why. And it turns out they announced that we had just bombed Hiroshima and the war would soon be over. And, oh, she figured that's why they told her, because their son was due to be sent to the Pacific area, and they were expecting loads of casualties. The last line of the broadcast, this program to develop this super incredible new weapon, this atomic bomb, was done under the direction of General Leslie Groves. That's when she found out what he'd been doing for the previous two years. Wow, that's really amazing. amazing. You know, I, well, I, I, I just did an interview with you, so just so people understand some of the stuff with Black Projects, I think you're absolutely right. I just did an interview with somebody whose mother worked for EG&G for 30 years. He had absolutely zero idea what his mother did for them until probably after her death when he talked to his brother because she had confided in him some things because he was also in the government. He actually was one of the spokespeople after 9-11. He worked for uh, Army Intelligence or something like that. But 30 years, he had no idea what his mother did. She well, I believe him. that. And it, it, look, it, loose lips sink ships sounds like a silly slogan, but during the war... That was important because there were spies and they didn't, especially things like uh, ship movements, you know, the U-boat commanders would love to know that there's this ship leaving New York on this date heading east to Britain. Uh, keep your eye open. It's a big one. You know, uh, that's the real world. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, a very good case of disinformation. We worked very hard to convince Hitler that the invasion of Europe, everybody knew was going to happen sometime, but where? And we worked very hard to convince Hitler that the where was callous, Calais. Uh, and there were even false buildings erected across the yeah, uh, if, channel. If you, if, you know, one of my favorite stories ever of World War II is Jasper Maskelin, who was a magician, and he he uh, created all these blow-up tanks and all these things to convince Hitler that the, that the invasion was coming from someplace else. Hundreds of tanks were like blown up on the field, and they're and they're uh, and they let the planes, the Nazi planes, fly over and see this stuff. Fake jeeps, fake planes. You know, yeah. that was a, it was an official lie. <laughs> yeah, that was misdirection, a finest misdirection ever. You know, well, they even put phony documents in the jacket of an officer who had died, and they dumped him off uh, Spain, knowing that the Germans would get him. And they, they weren't blatant. They didn't say, we're going to attack hither, hither, on. But any sensible uh, analyst would conclude that the landing was going to be at uh, Calais. And the, uh, Hitler's generals, when we landed at Normandy, said, send in the reserves. They're attacking. No, 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 no. That's not the real attack. They're going to yeah, attack he, over here. He thought that was just a distraction from the real yeah attack. so he, he made it till he sent the panzers dumb mistake well yeah but it does illustrate the importance of this information uh it can serve a major objective and good better and different is beside the point but you can cause uh, false attitudes uh where it matters the most uh, we knew by breaking, well, there's, there's a good example of keeping secrets. We broke the German codes at the beginning of World War II, Enigma Project and all this sort of stuff. Now, you'd think when the war was over, we'd tell everybody, look what we did. Oh, no. It, no there was no public discussion of having broken the codes for 25 years after the war. The reason was that there were other people using those, other countries using those machines. And we were reading their mail, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a computer science student, so I, I've read all about Turing and the, and what he did yeah. to break the Enigma. There's a movie, too, isn't there? Yeah. There's never a great, movie. Great movie. Yeah. It's a shame what happened to him after that, but he was a genius to figure, yeah. figure this out and really help win the war. Well, there were 12,000 people at Bletchley Park where that operation was being conducted. Not one of them spoke up for 25 years after the war. 
So can secrets be kept? You darn right they can. We're not talking two people. We're talking 12,000 who kept their mouths closed. <laughs> so, well, I guess the stakes were high and people didn't want anybody to die if they were, you know... You didn't need to convince the Brits that the war was hell. And <laughs> let's face it. <laughs> you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I happen to be uh, one of those uh, computer science volunteers for the SETI project. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I do the SETI at home. I've got basically a uh, super... Well, SETI stands for Silly Effort to Investigate, yes. right? And listen, I, even though I am a volunteer for that project and have been for years, I have, a, I have the... Uh, Basically, I have a supercomputer built from uh, junk in my garage. Oh, <laughs> which neat! Was, uh, which was, uh, but it has it has the it has the computational power of about fifty uh, brand new desktop PCs, I'd say. And I just churn the data that they send me. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's kind of ridiculous the way that they're going about it because it's really uh, it's really stupid to think that oh, some advanced civilization is still using radio waves. Can you talk about what you feel about that stuff? Well, I can certainly say that my one of my mantras is technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. In other words, uh, a laser is not just a better light bulb. <laughs> They're both sources of light, but entirely different physics. And everywhere you look, uh, I don't use a slide rule anymore. It was a perfectly effective tool, but I can buy a little cheap calculator and do a lot more yeah, <laughs> and a lot faster. Mr. Friedman, I'm one of those people that didn't know what a side, slide rule was, and I'm a computer science student. I had to go look it up, and then I, 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 I decided to order one just so I could see how you got really? your calculations. Yeah, and I don't, I, I barely grasped the concept. I mean, I kind of get it, but uh, you're, what you said is that you don't still use a slide rule to do calculations because there's better ways, and I totally yes. agree with that. And that's how I feel about looking for alien civilizations through radio waves. It seems naive to me. Why would anybody send us a signal using technology appropriate to us? The first long-distance radio signal on Earth uh, it happened here in Canada, Newfoundland. Uh, Marconi sent a signal from England. Uh, and that was in 1901. And that's not very long ago. You think they haven't figured out something better? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, and uh, besides, who, who are they sending to? Aren't they making what? some efforts now? to look for laser energy. Well, yeah, they're looking at for laser uh, laser things. It's the same problem. Why would anybody send one here? Uh, we've got all kinds... And why do the SETI people refuse to look at the UFO evidence? Well, let me give you an example of a miscalculation they made. Not, not bad science, just they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, Frank Drake many years ago said there could be as many as 8,000 planets in the galaxy that could be sending us signals. 8,000! Wow! And now the number is in the billions uh, of planets. Yes, yeah, so that famous Drake equation was a little bit off, apparently. Well, yeah, the, the Drake equation, you know, to call it an equation, y equals mc squared, uh, is, is silly, because we don't know the values of any of the parameters. What's the lifespan of a civilization? We don't even know what our lifespan is, no less any large number of others. What would we expect out there? That's a total unknown. And remember that we're assuming uh, we have a planet that rotates. Uh, why wouldn't you send from a distant planet in another solar system to a device that is in orbit? You know, we have guys, <laughs> we have devices that sit in one place that send signals back down, you know, one place with regard to the surface of the uh, Earth. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things, if you've got all kinds of data, why don't the SETI people look at the UFO evidence? Ted Phillips has collected 5,000 physical trace cases from 80 countries, cases where the saucers are seen on or near the ground, and when they leave, one finds physical changes, the equivalent of footprints, <laughs> which have been seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, burn circles, burn rings, landing gear marks. And one-sixth of those cases involve reports of beings associated with the craft on the ground. 
and you know, you read your first 200 cases, and it's dull after a while. Same thing is happening all over the planet. Uh, of course, uh, Ted didn't know when he started off his stuff about these things like at Malmstrom Air Force Base, where when the UFO shows up, all the missiles shut down. Uh, that's scary as can be. Yeah, I can imagine, if you're, especially if you're one of the government people, trying to explain that to your boss, what happened that day, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, and you, you don't, it's impossible. You don't want it to happen. It can't happen. You set up the system so it can in, Incidentally, in the Soviet Union, uh, and, and there's a NASA, former NASA scientist, Dr. Richard Haynes, who's gone into this, and there's a wonderful book, uh, Nukes and UFOs, by Robert Hastings. Uh, and he goes into these nuclear weapons on top of rockets. In the Soviet Union, suddenly a bunch of missiles went live, started countdown. Fortunately, there was a guy down there who shut them off. But uh, this has been going on for some time. I think somebody's sending us a message, and it does relate to, I think one of the major reasons for coming here is to quarantine us. In other words, to keep us from taking our brand of friendship out there. Yeah, now we could be dangerous to a whole nother, to, to their civilizations. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what people forget, we have exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons on this planet. People look at me like, what are you, crazy, Stan? What do you mean 2,000? That's what the numbers are. All the countries that have them tested them, tested in the air and on the ground and underwater and underground and... 2000, and the thing about nuclear explosions is they leave residue, uh, radioactive materials that only could come from nuclear explosions. Uh, and so one reason for coming here is to quarantine us, I think, and the other is to keep track because we, and it sounds silly to some people, we're a threat to them. What do you mean we're a threat to them? Well, when you look at the fusion devices, and you convert that into a propulsion system. We could go out and take our brand of friendship out there. But everybody knows it's hostility. You know, so, yeah, we're a threat to the beings out there. After Pearl Harbor, you'd think everybody would realize that you got to watch out for surprise attacks. You know, one of the things about Pearl Harbor, <laughs> it's kind of funny, uh, in late November... 1941 uh, there was the Army-Navy football game and in the program for the game it quoted somebody as saying it had a picture of the USS Arizona big battleship nobody has ever sunk a big ship from the sky and a week later was Pearl Harbor and it went down under the water it was sunk badly 1,100 guys died on board that. The Japanese knew you could sink a ship from the sky. Yeah, wasn't, wasn't that like the, uh, the Navy's kind of uh, pushback against uh, against an Air Force? Or yeah, Billy Mitchell. Yeah, Billy Mitchell had said at the end of the First World War that there will be sinking of ships with bombs from the sky. And the Secretary of the Navy had said something silly like, I'll be willing to stand on any ship he thinks he can sink from with a bomb from the sky. Yeah, his words Yeah, it was a little late, and a lot of guys lost their lives. Uh, so uh, that goes back again. Progress comes from doing things differently. If you can call being better at sinking ships progress, but I guess if you're a Navy man, why not? <laughs> now, it, it, the world is an interesting place, and so have an interesting place in it. There have been dozens of uh, theses done, which nobody refers to, of course. Uh, I have ten of them in my book, Top Secret Magic. I list them. But there have been a lot. One of them was on press coverage of this subject. Dr. Herbert Strentz uh, went on to be dean of journalism at uh, Drake University. Uh and he had some scathing remarks to make about the inadequacy of the press coverage. He had read 10,000 clippings. That would drive me up the wall. I've read a lot, but I've never read that many. Yeah, it seems yeah. to me they always kind of do this tongue-in-cheek, you know, yeah. almost laugh at the, the, the subject, you know. We're getting better. I, th I think this Kepler has had some impact on that, that the notion that we're the big shots and the one solar system, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is going down the tubes. Well, arrogance. You know what's funny is that I, I, I recall specifically
specifically asking about other planets when I was in grade school. And uh, at that time, we didn't have any of these uh Oh no! Oops. And so uh, I, I was told adamantly that the only known planets are in our solar system. There are no other planets. And I was sure that if there's all these other stars, there's got to be planets. And I would argue with the teachers, and they would say, "No, you're wrong. There's only planets here." So we've come a long way towards at least acknowledging, you know, that there is oh, yeah. planets now. Well, Pat Robertson will tell you that all the intelligent life in the universe is on planet Earth, and this UFO stuff is the uh, demons, yeah. the work of the devil. And he'll also tell you that Earth is only 6,000 years old, too. So yeah, I mean, isn't that neat? Uh, look how lucky we are to be at the or the right end of the 6,000 years. Of course, they should have said 4 billion, but what the heck? Well, it's a few zeros between friends, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. When somebody tells me that kind of stuff, I just, I, I don't even speak to them. Because you can't convince somebody that's that's that convinced. It's not, I tell them the Bible's not a science book, you know? It's a nice no. stories. It's good, it's good to learn morality from. But other than that, I mean, I, you know. Well, it's got a lot of UFO stories in it, too. you got to read the book yeah. by Dr. Barry Downing, The Bible and Flying Saucers. I believe that I did, and I'm well aware of a lot of those different things, and Ezekiel's Wheel, and, and all yeah. those different things, and, and ancient astronaut theory. It's, it's yeah. really amazing to me. I heard a paper by a couple at the University of Delaware. They looked at 11 old civilizations, and all of them, without exception, had stories about craft vehicles coming down from the sky carrying beings, not angels, beings. Uh, and these go back thousands of years. So our arrogance, uh, you know, we're being taken down a peg or two, I think, and I'll give Kepler <laughs> some of the credit for that. Uh, we're not so special. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I heard I heard somebody say, and I think it's a great way to explain it, is that, you know, the more science progresses, the more we realize how not special we are. We used to think we were the center of the universe. Yes. Oh, well, uh, okay, we're just the Earth revolving, revolving around the sun, and, and now we're in a galaxy that's revolving around other galaxies. It just keeps getting worse and worse for us, I guess. Well, look, when I was in the fifth grade, our teacher in the science class, it was a long time ago, some science, anyway, she said that the uh, sun sits still and the planets revolve around the sun. And I had just read in our 49 cent a volume encyclopedia bought at the supermarket uh, that uh, the whole solar system is moving around the center of the galaxy at 12 miles a second which just seemed extraordinarily fast and I piped up and she put me down I was a straight A student I wasn't accustomed to being put down so I didn't say anything but the next day I brought in the volume of the encyclopedia <laughs> and she admitted that well maybe that's the way it is well almost 50 years later I went back to my hometown in New Jersey for a high school reunion 50th. And the, I'm talking to the guys, and I mentioned Miss Gutkin. She, she was the teacher. And, you know, she still is alive. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, she she goes to the same synagogue that I had belonged to. <laughs> and I went and saw her and, and had a quiet discussion. A, a movie had just been made, Stanton Friedman is Real. <laughs> And I had told some of the story. So I, I gave a censored version to her. Then she said, look, what did I know about science? I got a, she got a master's degree later, but at that time, you know, I thanked her because it made me determined to get the facts before I spoke up. And that, that's my rule. Have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. I try but, to live by that, too. I should thank you for that. I, try to, I really try to follow that. I don't speak on something I haven't adequately invested or, or really done my due diligence on. Well, that's the way it should be, especially when you're communicating to lots of people. One-on-one -on -one is, you know, a, a different situation, but when you're telling people, millions of people, 
Uh, and sometimes the debunkers do talk to millions, just like some of us believers do. Uh, it, it, well, let, let me give you an example of that. Bill Nye, the science guy, and I were on a, a television program. Yeah, I'm very and, familiar with that. I thought that was and, awesome. Well, he says, you know, Friedman talks about cover-up and stuff. All well, those documents, they cover up people's names. That's a privacy issue. It's not security. Well, I happen to have a copy of my book, Flying Saucers and Science, with me. So I opened it up, and I found the page, luckily, and showed this is what I'm talking about. Uh, and it was essentially all blacked out. And it was a technical document. It was not a privacy issue at all. But he got away with saying that, at least until I piped up, because yeah, nobody... Like you said, be, be, uh, you do your research by proclamation. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a great example of that. And, you know, uh, it, it's a battle, but what I like... Look, I've given over 700 lectures. I've only had 11 hecklers, and two of them were drunk. Uh, and so I'm not a people people tell me you must get a hard time from the press and the audiences and stuff and I say I don't uh, I've been asked to poll an audience uh, at the end of a lecture at the uh, University of Manitoba and I said well I don't usually ask my audience uh, participants to stick their necks out that's my job he said I don't think anybody mind everybody clapped this is the question and answer period okay I had shown some Gallup poll data so how many people think no UFOs or alien spacecraft? Fewer than 10% of the audience. Well, how many think some UFOs are alien spacecraft? 90% of the people. It was very hard to find somebody who didn't. And, but the problem is the fear of ridicule. And when I check at the end of my lecture, I normally ask, I'll make a little joke. I get the first question. We didn't let the CIA in. I want to know how many of you believe that you've seen what I would consider to be a flying saucer. I defined my terms earlier in the lecture. And uh, just raise your hand, and I'll point and count. So they raise their hand. The hands go up barely over their heads, you know, hesitantly. And I go, one, two, three, four, five. By the time I get over the other side of the hall, it's 10% of the audience and the hands go up vigorously. And, but then I ask, uh, how many of you reported what you saw? 90% of the hands go down. <laughs> and I tried a little experiment in a classroom early in the day before a college lecture, and I arranged with the prof that he would count the votes. I wanted the kids to vote with their eyes closed. I asked two questions. How many of you think most people don't believe in UFOs? 80% of the hands went up. Then I asked, how many of you do believe that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft? 80% of the hands went up. <laughs> Fear of ridicule is apparently an important human emotion. Yeah, I can, I can imagine a lot of people just don't don't come forward because they don't want they don't want to be labeled a nut, you know. Yeah, even though most people believe in UFOs, most people believe most people don't believe in UFOs, <laughs> and they act accordingly. Even the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is one of my is my second favorite case, and that is the Bob Lazar story. Now I know I know how you feel about him, and that uh, you know uh, mostly because his educational credentials couldn't be verified. But recently, uh, Jeremy Corbell found a, a witness that placed him uh, at uh, yes Los as and said he was in the security briefings. Yeah, and I, I I talked to you briefly about this, but I found another new witness whose mother worked for EG and G. Yeah, I'm waiting to find out. I'm waiting to find out more about that. I have never denied that Bob worked out at Los Alamos. His name is in the phone book. I checked with the lab, and the number that was next to his name was that of the Clinton D. Anderson Maison Accelerator Facility. That it's an even longer name than that. It's a unique facility, and professors come. From from all over the country to run experiments there because there isn't any other place to run those particular experiments. And so I was satisfied that he worked there. No question about it. 
But nobody has said, shown any piece of paper that gives his job title. Now, I talked to the man you're talking about who, uh, on the phone, I had a long conversation with him. It's a strange name. I want to say Cromegli, but that's not right. Uh, Crankle? I, I don't have my notes in front Crank, of me. No, Crankle. Crankle, yeah. I think you're right. An unusual name. I'd never run across the name before. And I had a long conversation with him. He's got a Ph.D. in physics from MIT, supposedly Bob's alma mater, but many years before. And so we had a long conversation. He had seen him there, and he looked like a scientist because he had the pocket protector. I must admit I use a pocket protector <laughs> protect my shirts. My wife goes crazy if I get all kinds of ink on the shirts. Uh, anyway, and I asked him, he had seen Bob there at a security briefing. Look, everybody who works at Los Alamos has to have a security clearance. If you sweep the floor, it doesn't matter. Um, I said, did you do anything to verify that he had a degree, that he was a scientist? No, why should I? And I know he was there. I know he had a security clearance or he wouldn't have been at the briefing. Uh, and so he did not verify that Bob was a scientist. Now, Jeremy is saying he did, but I've talked to Jeremy briefly, and we did a program together, and uh, I talked to uh, this guy, and I don't think we have established that Bob is a scientist. And the funny thing is, uh, George Knapp, who I consider an outstanding journalist, yeah, he, he's the one who... He and you are my two favorite guys in this in this whole mess. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I'm in good yeah, company. Actually, well, I, I always... I always joke about you you got me started in this with all these books and I always said if I ever got to talk to you or meet you in person I, I, I wouldn't know whether to give you a big hug and thank you or to punch you in the face so <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault uh, that's all your fault well, well, spend so much time on this stuff now the interesting thing both of us are from New Jersey uh, oh, wow. George is was from Jersey Woodbury that's down near end of the state I think okay. uh, uh, anyway, uh, I have the greatest respect for George, and when I my book, Flying Saucers and Science, came out, I made sure that he was the coast-to-coast -coast host when I talked about it, and he read the book, asked sensible questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, the last time I talked to George in person, uh, he said he didn't think Bob had those degrees. So he agreed with that. He had given me, for people who don't know the story, he had given me the name of Bob's high school. Uh, and I called them and uh, called them back when they dug out his records and found that he'd finished in the bottom third of his high school class and had one science course, chemistry. Now, there's no way you can get into MIT with those credentials got to be in the top 10 or 15 percent they might stretch it to 20 if your uh, college board scores were super special or something like that but uh, so George uh, gave me that information I pass it on to him and he agreed uh, but uh, I checked with uh, MIT. I talked to five different people at MIT, and he doesn't show up anywhere. I talked to the legal counsel who said there's no way to wipe his records clean. I talked to Caltech. No sign of uh, Bob. Uh, now, also at a meeting in Rachel, Nevada, at the Little Ailey Inn, good place for hamburgers. Larry King and I had hamburgers there one time when I was doing a show out there. Uh, at Rachel, somebody asked Bob for to name some of his professors, and he thought for a minute and said, uh, "There's a certain guy he gave his name uh, who will remember me from Caltech Physics." Well, I, that guy was in my directly the American Physical Society, of which I am a member, and Bob was not. Uh, and he never taught at Caltech, only at Pierce Junior College, which is close geographically, but far intellectually. And Bob, he did have Bob in a course that he taught at, taught at Pierce. Uh, at the same time, when he was supposedly at MIT, incidentally, 2,500 miles away. So George had no problem telling me he didn't think Bob had the degree, but my response is, why would you believe anything else he said? Especially about element 115, uh, which was discovered not by Bob Lazar. Uh, he had nothing to do with its discovery. It was a big accelerator was operated for a month and they produced four atoms of element 115. They were expecting to find 
uh, some 115. Because we look at the periodic table and know your physics, uh, there should be some isotopes. 115. But it has a half-life less than a minute. And there is no way you can accumulate 500 pounds of this stuff, which Bob said that uh, Los Alamos had. And he had stolen some. I don't know how he managed that. It would have been the most valuable stuff around, you know. So uh, Jeremy has said that uh, Crankle had verified. But to say that a guy looked like a physicist and had a pocket protector is not enough to make him a scientist. He's got no publications. He's, nobody's provided a piece of paper that gives his name. And many people think, well, if you're working in Los Alamos, you've got to be a scientist. No way. Like I'm a sure GE. They have, I'm sure they have just technicians. They have IT people that aren't scientists. Oh, yeah. IT guys. They have, well, you know. The, the number at generally... The, the number at General Electric was 1,100 engineers and scientists out of 3,500 employees. Sure. When I was there. And so, you know... Uh, One of the things I always wanted to ask you, though, is putting his this problem with his education aside, and and one of the things I, I keep coming back to is Snowden being a high school dropout and somehow getting to work on these huge top-secret NSA well, programs. Because, there's a difference between security and science. Yes, but my point being that maybe, maybe uh, he overstated his credentials or just lied about them. I don't know, but the guy had a particle accelerator in his spare bedroom, and he built jet-powered cars. Yes, he did. He was a smart guy. I've always said that. Well, one of the things that I always think is that maybe the government didn't care about his education. They just wanted somebody to look at these craft, maybe somebody with an out. Well, but where's his, where's his past record of achievement with regard to far-out systems development? I can't find one. His buddy called me and asked, this is 20-some years ago, uh, what would it take to convince you that Bob is telling the truth? Uh, it was not an acrimonious phone conversation. I said, well, it would take a resume, copies of his diplomas, a list of his papers, memberships in professional groups, stuff like that. Okay. Well, I sent him an, an eight-page resume. <laughs> I probably couldn't find one now. But, uh, and a list of my papers and pages from the directories of the American Nuclear Society and the American Physical Society. I'm a member of both, and Bob isn't uh, a member of either. And I sent him all this stuff. I never got anything back. In other words, scientists leave an imprint, which is more... Uh, like I say, Bob is a smart guy. Uh, I've never said he wasn't. Well, one of the things I've always wondered if he, he wasn't just some sort of uh, renegade, homegrown kind of inventor, kind of guy, tinkerer, and uh, somehow walked his way into some of these top secret programs. Well, but I think if he, working at Los Alamos, it made sense to work out at the accelerator facility because the professors coming from elsewhere could not often bring their grad students with them. So they needed technicians people to help get the data. If you're at your own university and you're using an accelerator, you've got grad students to do all the, the dog work. Uh, so that, it makes sense. That's not a place, technician doesn't need a degree. Sure. Uh, and so uh, that he had a clearance, like I say, uh, clearances uh, are, are entirely, everybody at Los Alamos has to have a clearance. Uh, so I'm, I'm not denying that. Yeah. I agree with you. And, re, you know, I started looking into this and investigating it, and I try to keep an open mind. I, I came into it with the same opinion as you. If he lied about his education, I, I don't know that I can trust anything he said, but I keep finding this stuff. And recently, I just found a new witness who puts him on Janet Airlines flying into Area 51. Well, I, I don't... And, he, when I had one phone conversation with him, and it was cordial, and uh, it was clear that he worked on... Uh, radiation detectors and yeah, so from something been flying into Area 51 working on their radiation detectors I suppose yeah or, or in some other capacity that didn't involve extraterrestrial spacecraft yeah yeah that, that's that's what I'm saying so I'm waiting to find out more and I I would like to hear more about the woman who was 
uh, worked for EG. EG and, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. send you. I just finished the show and uploaded it. I, I have it. It's on YouTube. I'm going to send you the link to your email so you can hear this okay. story and, and see what you think. And the other thing I would ask you is, do you give no credence to the polygraph that he passed? Because he passed, uh, as far as I know, one or two polygraphs. I don't know enough about those. Polygraphs are kind of tricky. There are people who can beat them, but I don't know what questions were asked. I mean, is Bob a smart cookie? Did he work at Los Alamos? The answer is yes to both of those. Well, I saw some footage that Jeremy Corbell published that he got from George Knapp of those polygraphs, and they did ask some very specific questions. Did you work at an area called S4 in the Area 51 complex? Did you work on back engineering? alien spacecraft and he answered yes did you uh, embellish or you know make up any parts of your story no you know and uh, I don't know what I think about polygraphs but that was kind of compelling evidence to me I'll have to dig into that some more I haven't seen that footage I will grant you well I I guess the, the last thing I would want to ask you is you've looked into this UFO stuff for 50 years what is the bottom line? What do you think, if, if there really are extraterrestrials coming here, what do they want? What's the agenda? Why are they visiting us? Well, I got a whole chapter in my book about the UFO why questions. And certainly, what do they want? Uh, I, I've given a number of solutions. I think one thing, they want to quarantine us. Two, they want to keep track of the idiots in the neighborhood to make sure there are no surprise attacks. Three, they may be mining the stuff that's here. That we, you, know, you know what uranium was used for 100 years ago? A yellow heard, coloring agent. Yeah, I heard you say they, they colored <laughs> plates with it or China, right? That's right. Yeah, China. And that's illegal now, of course, but because uh, you know, it's radioactive and some of it washes off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we have so many stories going back so long. It would seem that maybe alien universities send their graduate students here to do their thesis work on the development of a primitive society. Yeah, I, I uh, thought that. Maybe it's some kind of anthropo anthropology project. Maybe this was a penal colony. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here and that's why we're so nasty to each other <laughs> and uh, you know there is stuff here that's rare that we don't even know to pay attention to there, there are loads of reports over a thousand that i'm aware of of saucers un submerged unidentified <laughs> flying object unidentified submerged objects usos uh they may be mining the bottom of the oceans there are all kinds of nodules of metals and diamonds off the coast of africa and all kinds of stuff we don't know what why did the people come to uh, the new world after columbus now, steal the gold of course no it was to convert the heathens no it was to develop new vegetables uh, tomatoes and potatoes and uh, tobacco uh, you know there's a huge variety <laughs> of, and to steal land and all kinds of other things <clears throat> so we don't know uh, it would stand to reason that the Galactic Federation would be monitoring the, the neighborhood you don't want surprise attacks uh, also you're always looking for a place to retreat to if something if an asteroid destroys your planet partly you know if a supernova goes off and you need to relocate uh, you got to know what's going on in the neighborhood so uh, I think there are loads of reasons and look for all we know Eisenhower really did meet with aliens there are two stories that uh, look probably true uh, and you know, I, I have the greatest respect for Eisenhower. He was looked down upon by the Eastern establishment. I didn't go to Harvard, Yale, or any place like that. But anybody who could get the Germans on our side versus the Russians after the war, when France, the United States, and England had been fighting, had fought two wars with Germany, has to have appropriate skills of handling people, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think he's an amazing historical figure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, even if he didn't go to Harvard or Yale. Sure. <laughs> you know? So I, I think there are a lot of questions we haven't answered. Uh, that's why I write books to try to answer them, but with the, the appropriate restriction. I haven't talked to any aliens. 
I don't know what they want. Who knows what drives them? Uh, but I, I do know that we have the experience of explorers, uh, of our own experience. Every nation on the planet, a big one, has an air defense command to monitor the sky so they don't have surprise attacks. Uh, so it would stand to reason as, as soon as you expand the, the baseline from a planet to a solar system to a galactic neighborhood that you still have the same problem. There might be rogues or idiots out there. There's been no shortage of them here on this planet after all. <laughs> would you trust that guy in North Korea with atomic bombs? No, I mean, absolutely not. And I guess yeah, that, the final question I would ask you is, do you think that the government is ever going to come clean with everything that they know, or do you think it's just going to be lost in the, in the well, I black think forever? If we can get some media group in today's world to find a new Woodward and Bernstein, look, if, as soon as you bring up the 156 pages of NSA documents that you can read one sentence in, as soon as you show the CIA top secret documents that you can't read, oh, I haven't mentioned General Carol Bolander. Uh, he was an Air Force general who was asked, what should we do about Project Blue Book? This was after the Condon reporter recommended that it be closed. Well, he was an engineer working on the lunar excursion module, but he was asked to come up with a position statement. And his memo in October of 69 uh, recommended that it be closed because he said reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with JNAP 146 or Air Force Manual 55-11 and are not part of the Blue Book system. That's an extraordinary statement. Two paragraphs later, he says, if the government closes Project Blue Book, the public won't have a re um, organization, to a place to report UFO sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose. Now, as far as I know, I'm the only guy in the UFO community who talked to General Bolander. I located him 10 years later, uh, had a conversation said, it seems to me you're saying they're two separate communication channels. He said yes. Yeah, anything that affected, that could affect national security was a separate project from Blue Book. That's why we've never yeah. gotten all the files. And that's the ones that are the most important, obviously. You know, if they go to sack bases, I had one report which I told them about of a saucer flying down the runway at a sack base where nuclear weapons were stored, and I say, by definition, I think that's a, a report which could affect national security, don't you think? And he agreed. So uh, when we look at that, uh, if we get a Woodward and Bernstein, new generation, to really dig into this, they could do it in six months. And all the denials in the world won't change the fact that there are these documents around. Top secret umbra. And don't tell me it's all sources and methods and 99% of the documents are sources and methods. And you can give me one sentence a page. Come on. You know, nobody's going to believe that. Yeah. I don't think. I don't yeah. think so. It's unfortunate that they keep everything from the people. Well, that's the way they're playing the game. As long as we let them, they're happy to. Well, Mr. Friedman, I could not agree with you more. And I, for one, am not going to let them. And neither should you, my fellow truth seekers. But sadly, that music means that we are almost at the end of our time here on the Midnight Hour. And at the Mystery Man Show, I think it's appropriate that we end this incredible discussion with UFO legend Stan Friedman on the subject of government conspiracy and cover-up of the UFO subject. Because the truth is, no one has done more to end the government secrecy and government cover-up of UFOs than Mr. Stanton Friedman. You can visit his website at stantonfriedman.com. That's www.stantonfriedman.com. S-T-A-N-T-O-N-F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N.com. You can find out about his lecture schedule, buy some of his books, or learn more about what he's working on currently. And Mr. Friedman, I want to take the time to thank you immensely 
from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to talk to us tonight. It's been an immense pleasure and delight to talk to you and learn more about this incredible subject. I want to wish you the best on your continued journey to find the truth. It's, it's good to talk to somebody who knows something about the subject. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. I appreciate that. Well, my friends, I want to thank you for joining me for another edition of The Midnight Hour. You know, here at The Mystery Man Show, we had a real hard time starting this up. And I could say a lot of negative things about some of the so-called UFO community and other people not being quite accepting of what I was trying to do. But I have to say, that I'm amazed that someone of the caliber of Mr. Friedman was willing to come on the show as a guest and help me. When I started this show, I had an incredibly hard time getting good guests, and I never thought that someone of the caliber of Mr. Friedman would join me on the show. But out of the blue one day, I just called him up, explained what we were trying to accomplish here, talked about his books for a bit, and Mr. Friedman was awesome. He just said, when do you want to do it, kid? And off we went. And I have to thank him for that. Because he really did help us to get a great launch of the show. I also have to both mention and apologize for some strange audio echoing and glitches that we had during our interview with Mr. Friedman. But sadly, we were not able to fix some of this stuff. And I could not ask someone whose schedule is as busy as Mr. Friedman's to redo an entire few hour interview. So we had to go with what we had. I hope you'll forgive me for that. And I hope you'll understand that we are working really hard to make sure that we present the highest quality show possible going forward. And it's also important to mention that this show, as well as all of our previous shows, have been simply test or pilot episodes. These shows were produced with the intention of finding distribution on existing worldwide paranormal radio or podcast networks. And sadly, that distribution or support from those existing networks never came. But with that bad news comes some startling facts, and here they are. The Midnight Hour, The Mystery Man Show, has gotten more views, more listens, and more clicks than almost any other of those shows per episode on those existing networks. Now, this excludes some of the huge stars of the field, of course. But, for a new show, we have gotten an incredible amount of listeners, and I am so thankful to each and every one of you for that. The truth is, if you do the math, you will find that this show's numbers are literally crushing most of those hosts per episode that are on the networks we try to get on that rejected us. And the truth is, I am certainly no stranger to any artistic endeavor I have ever undertaken being initially rejected. It's just kind of par for the course. I'm used to it. I'm okay with it. The universe kind of steps aside for those so determined they will not be stopped. And you gotta know, friends and fellow truth seekers, that I am not somebody that's gonna be stopped so if we have to, I'm going to go it alone. And I've made my peace with that. I'm good with it. As long as I still produce high quality shows that I'll still be proud of many years later, I'll be good with that. I don't really care what else happens. But I would really like to be a vehicle for the truth, the real truth, behind many of these mysteries to finally come out. And like I said before, the news isn't all bad. We produced these pilot episodes that did amazingly well numbers-wise. And I'm really thankful to each and every one of you that tuned in and listened and helped make that happen. 
and we have been reaching out once again to some of those paranormal networks. Because the truth is, we could go it alone here, and I'm prepared to do that if absolutely necessary. But this show would be so much better with the help and support of more wide-scale distribution. So we've been taking some time to kind of re-communicate with some of those networks uh, now that we've established some of our capabilities. And I guess it's important that everyone knows that I have a few tricks up my sleeve for massively, massively increasing our listener base in the coming months and year ahead. And if negotiations go well with any of those other paranormal networks that are willing to give us some support and increase distribution, they too will benefit from those efforts. You know, what we're really looking for is a mutually beneficial relationship because I have a great deal of skills with all kinds of digital media and websites and social media promotion and all kinds of things. And I'm hoping that we could find a good fit somewhere where this show can find a home and we can both benefit from a good relationship. So as for me, I'm going to remain incredibly positive about producing this show going forward whatever it takes but listen if you are a listener of some paranormal radio network or podcast network and you think that they should carry our show take the time and email them give them links to the show that would really help us out and in the meantime i'm going to be incredibly busy promoting and producing new shows We've got an incredible new show coming up with UFO researcher Stan Gordon, exploring the mystery of Bigfoot and Bigfoot's possible relationship to the UFO and extraterrestrial phenomena. We've got another show I'm very proud of that I've been trying to finish for a long time. It's a show that details and reveals all the secrets of every fake psychic and fake medium you have ever heard of. Thanks for joining us once again on the Midnight Hour. My name is Stephen Cambion also known as the Mystery Man, reminding you that the truth is out there. You just have to know where to look for it.